Scientism is unbelievable. This idea of scientism is supported by a number of fake stories about Christianity at war with science. Scientism also ignores, on the flip side of the coin, positive evidence that Christianity helped provide some of the cultural matrix that was so science-friendly. But science, coupled with philosophical arguments, can give you really strong arguments for not only a designer, but certain characteristics of that designer. Scientism is unbelievable. Okay, so once we get the slides up, you'll see that. But science, I said scientism is unbelievable, not science. Science is a very reasonable, rational enterprise. But scientism is the view that only science, and especially not religion, is reasonable. Now, this idea of scientism is supported by a number of fake stories about Christianity at war with science. And I debunk uh, several of these, six of them, in my book. And I'll, uh, we'll pick up on a couple of these as examples today. Scientism also ignores, on the flip side of the coin, positive evidence that Christianity helped provide some of the cultural matrix that was so science-friendly. All right, let's pick up the negative side of the coin first. Um, there are many atheists uh, who claim that the number one characteristic of the history of science and religion is warfare, that the two have been at war with each other. And they particularly pick on Christianity, which is a rather curious thing as we see as we look at the details, because there's actually quite, evidence, quite a bit of evidence for positive interaction between the two, Christianity and science. Let's look at the big myth. According to this myth, uh, in modern science, when we discovered that the universe is really, really big, that this became a problem for traditional Christianity. Bill Nye uh, has a way of saying things in a way that sticks. Uh, I'm insignificant. I'm just another speck of sand. And the earth, really in the cosmic scheme of things, is another speck. And the sun, an unremarkable star. And the galaxy is a speck. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck among other specks, among still other specks, in the middle of specklessness. I suck. <laughs> well, what he really means there is uh, that the traditional religious understanding of human significance and uniqueness, that sucks. Because he goes on and later in his speech to the, as he's receiving an award for being such a, uh, a well-outspoken a secular humanist, um, he goes on to say that we are significant because we can do science. Now, from previous talks, you know, that is a part of our significance, that we have the rational capabilities to do science, but of course there's a, much more to the story than just that. Now, did ancient people thought, think the universe was small? Did ancient religious, particularly Hebrew people, think the universe was small? Well, just think about this quote from Psalm 103. And think about what was in the background of the psalmist as he wrote this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his, that is God's, steadfast love toward those who fear him. So turn to someone and explain. Is the background knowledge that the universe is really big or it's really, really small? Explain that to someone right next to you. Yeah, uh, it, of course, there... The, the psalmist is, is picturing in his mind a really big universe and comparing that to the bigness of God's love to those who come to him on his terms. Now, the, the ancient Greek view, typified by Ptolemy, one of the greatest uh, uh, ancient uh, astronomer, was that the earth is virtually dimensionless, or like a point, like a mathematical point, compared to the huge distance to the stars. Um, and he had a, a number of, uh, of very good arguments to support this, this view. Now, C.S. Lewis, who was very familiar with the history of literature through uh, ancient and medieval periods, that is, pre-modern, was quite aware that space feels infinite. I mean, even to us today, space seems like it just goes on and on to our imagination. And pre-modern people, uh, ancient and medieval, uh, imagined a very, very large cosmos. 
Now, he, Lewis then, uh, in sort of debunking this big myth as a problem for Christianity, uh, the big universe, he, he goes through the number of possibilities. So let's imagine that we look out uh, into outer space and suppose there's nothing except just the sun and the moon, no other objects out there. Um, well, the atheists could easily complain, you know, what a lot of wasted space, right? Um, or, or what a tiny universe, if, if, if you imagine that the sun and the moon and, and the earth is all there is. Uh, you know, what, what a boring universe, okay? Uh, but if there are other objects in space, and by the way, there are lots of them, um, then there are a number of other possibilities. And here I'm quoting Lewis. Um, These objects in space must be habitable or uninhabitable, or some combination thereof. And the odd thing is that both of these hypotheses are used to reject Christianity. So sort of unpacking in a, uh, what Lewis meant here is, um, suppose there are billions of habitable planets, maybe with uh, not just complex life, but intelligent life. Well then, the atheist would surely use that against Christianity to say, well, see, humans aren't really that special. We're lost in a crowd of aliens. Okay. What if the flip side were true? If, the plan if most planets were uninhabitable, well then they would say, you know, why would any self-respecting designer design a universe with trillions of sterile planets? Okay. Now, um, so a big universe being, becoming a problem for Christianity, the reason why that's not true is, first of all, ancient and medieval theologians and scientists uh, knew the universe was big, or at least imagined it being big. Uh, it was part of the cultural background. And um, atheists can find something to complain about, regardless of the size, small or big, and contents, uh, habitable or, in, in, uh, uh, or not habitable uh, planets and so on. So it's, it's a kind of a metaphysical game. It's been rigged, sort of a heads I win, tails you lose type thing, which I learned as a young child when my brother played this on me. It's not a fair game. <laughs> I learned very quickly. Now there's also an epistemological game rigging that goes on, and that's what scientism is all about. So I'm gonna relate the current philosophical view of scientism to the history of science and theology, because th th there's an important thing to learn from this. Remember, scientism is the view that only science is rational. Now, that statement itself, that only science is rational, or, or the best of all rationality, is itself not a scientific statement, because you can't discover that through a microscope or a telescope or through doing experiments. It's actually a philosophical statement about science, right? Now, an objection to scientism that's obvious is that scientism is self-defeating, because scientism is a philosophical statement asserted to be true and rational, namely that only science is rational. Um, so it's like cutting off the limb that you're sitting on, okay? So it's self-defeating. Um, it's the, so uh, the, a recent way of dodging this obvious objection is to say that, well, philosophy is a kind of science, uh, maybe not as rigorous as the traditional natural sciences of physics, chemistry, and biology, and so on, but it's also a kind of science. And uh, the way this is done uh, leads to another objection, and that is that you're also rigging the game if your philosophy assumes there's no way to test whether or not certain th uh, theological views are true, particularly just the, the sheer existence of God, whether that can be tested. Um, so it's a heads, I win, my science philosophy wins, tails, you lose. Your science, philosophy, theology, whatever conglomeration of ideas you have loses if it's untestable. And they assert that those who believe in God believe in a, in a view that's untestable, can't be evaluated by evidence. Now I want to give you just one example in just two brief slides. You might think, uh, how, how does this relate to the history of science? But remember, my talk is also about the history of faith, history of religious faith compared to science. But it's, it is true that you can evaluate, for example, certain claims of the Christian faith. For example, the resurrection. Did it happen? Um, there are various naturalistic theories about it not happening compared to the Christian view that God raised Jesus from the dead. 
Now, there are a number of facts that need to be explained by any theory, whether uh, a th uh, the Christian theory or the naturalistic theories. You we need to explain how the tomb became empty. You'd have to explain appearance reports. And you would also have to explain how it is that the disciples came to believe in a resurrection in the absence of the cultural conditions that, in other words, people at the time weren't generally expecting a resurrection at that time. And so it was a big surprise to them. All right, so uh, there are various, ver uh, various traits of a theory that indicate likely truth. One of them is evidential accuracy, and this applies to evaluating historical claims, scientific claims, and many other fields. Um, does the theory make sense of the evidence that you have? So, a well-guarded tomb, it's hard to steal the body, hard to get a conspiracy going, isn't it? Uh, causal adequacy is another uh, trait of a good theory. And um, it's the idea that, that the, the cause that's proposed in your explanation or theory is known in our routine experience to produce the kind of effect needed to be explained. Uh, so self-interest can be adequate in some cases to cause a lie, a coordinated lie, a conspiracy. Uh, but if, um, if those who first proclaim the resurrection me message suffered, and they did suffer a lot for that, that's not in your self-interest if your resurrection is your lie and you're aware that it's a lie. So that's where causal adequacy would fail in a conspiracy theory. Uh, a real resurrection uh, could have uh, good uh, could rate highly in the category of causal adequacy uh, because these people were willing to be martyred or at least persecuted for the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, which they claimed to see or know people directly. So uh, that sort of, uh, if, if Jesus did rise from the dead, that does provide adequate reasons or causes for the people's behavior. Now, um, you, you can also apply this to scientific claim. This is an example of a historical claim. In the world of science, what is the adequate cause for um, the, uh, the, the extreme engineering found in wrist and, and ankle joints from our previous talk? Well, you need to have a cause that's adequate. We know that in our routine uh, experience of the world that engin human engineers can make some very ingenious devices, not quite as good as the ankle and the, and the wrist, but, but, but quite, quite efficient and, and flexible. So. Um, so causal adequacy is known to uh, be a very important trait of a good theory, particularly in origin science, where you cannot see the, uh, how life first originated by replaying the tape of time, um, but we know what human intelligent agents can do, and, and so uh, the same kind of cause intelligent agency at a higher level would have been needed to get the kind of biological engineering that we see. So uh, there are a number of good uh, a number of traits that characterize good theories, evidential accuracy and causal adequacy are two of those. Now, scientism's warfare myth, such as, uh, basically it, it consists of a set of stories and they're coordinated to help people imagine or to better imagine a world without God. So stories like, I'm just a speck, you know, the nice little story, or religion hinders science, you know, uh, now, t t uh, you know, because religion uh, supposedly th uh, made us think that uh, the universe was really small um, and, um, and it was only modern science that discovered it was big. Or religion supposedly told us that um, the, the earth is flat and uh, only, modern, uh, only uh, scientists was, were able to finally overcome that after the Middle Ages ended and into the modern period. That it, these stories end up being historically totally inaccurate but I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. But scientism has a, a more general warfare story that, that consists of many of these smaller stories, and these stories help people to, to at least um, make it more plausible, if the stories were true, to think of a world without God. Scientism also falsely assumes that Christianity is untestable, and that's why they say that their science slash philosophy is superior because it's testable and it's past the test, whereas religious beliefs are just, well, beliefs you hold for no, just because you want to believe them, not because there, there's any evidence that might support them. But I just showed you an example of how some, uh, how some parts of the Christian faith can be directly tested. Um, so um, another part of scientism's war story is that 
that Christianity historically has, has hindered the development of these evaluative uh, methods of science, uh, which also apply to other disciplines, such as history, as I just demonstrated, evidential accuracy and causal adequacy. But the history of science, as you look at it in detail, actually defeats this further war story claim. And I want to look at a good example of that, and that's what I call the flat myth. The flat myth is actually a modern myth, it arose particularly in the 19th century, about what people earlier thought about Earth's shape, that is particularly uh, medieval uh, educated people, medieval Christians, who allegedly thought the Earth was flat, even though Aristotle and many other ancient scientists knew it was round and had good reasons for it, this, supposedly this knowledge was lost in the Middle Ages because of the bad influence of Christianity. So, Show of hands, how many of you were taught in school or read somewhere that Europeans thought the earth was flat until Columbus proved it was round? Raise your hand, okay, most of you. Wrong, okay? That's just not correct history. Um, all university students, and we're talking about universities which were a Christian invention, uh, arising particularly in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, here is the oldest building in Oxford that you're looking at. Um, that, um, and uh, students learned not only that the earth was round, but learned good reasons for believing that. Now, um, students today often can, well, they'll tell you they believe, they believe the earth is round, but often have, uh, have a hard time giving reasons for that. Here are two that were accessible uh, to medieval students in universities, uh, and even back to the time of Aristotle, when you look at uh, the, sh the uh, moon during a lunar eclipse, when the earth is casting a shadow on the moon, when you look at the edge of that shadow, you see that it's curved, which indicates that the object casting that shadow is also curved, and that's the earth. Or when you're traveling on earth, let's say you're traveling north from here, the further you travel north, the higher and higher in the sky the North Star appears, until finally you get on the North Pole, and then, of course, the North Star is directly overhead. And this indicates at least a north-south curvature for the Earth. Medieval university students were aware of these kinds of arguments, and others as well. So does it sound like Christianity, which sponsored and invented the universities, funded by the, by the church, were promoting or hindering the evaluated evaluative methods of science. Sounds like they were promoting them, right? Students learned not only the fact of Earth's roundness, but also uh, reasons for it. Okay, so scientism. Remember, this is scientism, not science. Scientism claims that Christianity hinders these evaluative methods of science. The history of science, giving just one example, really defeats that claim. And um, furthermore, even certain tenets of the Christian faith themselves can be evaluated by the, uh, what are called the theory virtues or the theoretical virtues. And I have an essay on this that, that details 12 of these traits of a good theory. And the, I've given you the first two as examples. But you can Google uh, virtues and my last name if you want to take a look at that article. Now let's look at another one of these m warfare myths and this is the Galileo myth. And uh, according to the myth, the church imprisoned and tortured Galileo for his scientific proofs. Okay. And uh, the, the, by this, I mean that they imprisoned him for a lengthy period of time and that they you know, tortured him until he finally said, okay, I, I give up. Even though he had proof of his uh, theory that the earth moved around the sun rather than uh, the other way around, rather than the the uh, earth being at rest in the center with the sun going around it. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll break apart this sentence and see how there are false components all along the way. Uh, first of all, what did Galileo see through the telescope that he crafted to um, look at things such as Venus and notice that it went through phases uh, somewhat like the moon goes through phases? Uh, this observation killed ancient astronomy. Okay, so you have on the left the modern 
picture of what, how things would work if the modern view is true, that the earth rotates, uh, revolves uh, around the sun. Uh, on the right is the ancient earth static view, the geocentric view, that earth is at rest and the sun goes around the earth. And Venus also goes around the earth in a large circle, which in turn, is, uh, there's a smaller circle called an epicycle carried on it that, that further rotate, rotates. And so that Venus is, uh, the motion of Venus is explained by the combination of two circular motions. Um, but the point here is that the ancient, according to the ancient view, Earth is at rest, and it's Venus and the Sun that do the moving, whereas on the left side, of course, it's the opposite view. Now, if the modern view is true, that uh, Earth goes around the Sun, and that Venus also goes around the Sun, but in a smaller orbit that's contained within large, Earth's larger orbit, then you should be able to see Venus going through not just crescent phases, think of a crescent moon shape, but also the gibbous or almost full moon phase. Uh, you should see that full range of phases of Venus if uh, the modern Copernican view is true. But if the ancient Earth-centered view is true, then uh, the only phases of Venus you should see are the, those crescent phases in different orientations, as you can see from the diagram, but nevertheless not the gibbous or almost full uh, moon-like uh, appearance. Now, with just the naked eye, you can't really tell whether Venus goes through phases or not, right? But with a telescope, such as Galileo had, you can tell the difference. And guess what he saw? Gibbous phases or not? He saw the gibbous phases, right? Which, the almost full phase. And that was a definitive disproof of the ancient view. But there was a third option. There was actually two modern views, not just one modern view. There was the Copernican view, shown on the left, but there was also a Tychonic view, which is not shown here. And the Jesuit astronomers in the uh, Collegio Romano, the uh, official uh, college in Rome of the Catholic Church, um, endorse the Tychonic view, and, and let's see why it was very reasonable, given the evidence available at the time, to, in, to endorse the Tychonic view. It actually best fit all the evidence uh, at the time. So according to the Tychonic view, uh, so in the big white diagram you see uh, Earth is still at the center, at rest, the little blue dot in the middle, and then the Sun, as you can see, goes around the Earth, but uh, according to the Tychonic system, Venus and Mars and the other planets orbit around the Sun as its center, uh, as their centers of orbit. And, uh, and so if that were the case, then, then if uh, someone living on the Earth, looking out in the direction of Venus and the Sun, would see, well, exactly what Galileo saw through his telescope. You would get not only crescent phases, but also gibbous phases when Venus is on the, uh, on the other side of the Sun as viewed from Earth, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, the, the observation of the phases of Venus definitively defeated the ancient Ptolemaic view, but it still left open two other options, two other modern options. Uh, and so the Inquisition, which I'm not a big fan of Inquisitions, okay, but it, the Catholic Inquisition was actually correct in, in claiming that Galileo exaggerated his, uh, his support for a moving Earth view. He really, Galileo, failed to prove it, but he had, he had some uh, suggestive arguments in his favor, but it wasn't really until a generation later, by the time of Newton, that it became uh, beyond reasonable doubt that uh, the moving Earth view was correct. So the chief inquisitor, Robert Bellarmine, uh, he uh, once wrote, and with Gal Galileo as one of the intended uh, readers of this pronouncement, that if Copernicanism were to be proved at some point in the future, and he was correct that it hadn't been uh, shown to be tr uh, true beyond reasonable doubt at the time, then, uh, Cardinal Bellamine wrote, one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary. Uh, so here we have a major church leader who was not anti-science, in fact, was aware of the majority viewpoint. And according to the majority viewpoint of science at the time, Galileo wasn't, hadn't made, given enough evidence to support his case. Okay. 
Now, Galileo and many church leaders got a number of things right in, in the, with a common understanding that the Bible uh, describes how nature appears, not the Bible wasn't intended to be a scientific textbook to, to tell us whether it's the sun that moves or the earth that moves, but we, we do know that the term sunset is, is an appearance kind of language. It doesn't, it's not intended to tell you what's really moving. It's just how things appear, that the sun appears. It is true that the sun appears to set below the horizon, right? And Copernicus himself used the term sunset. Um, and this was without error. Um, now, if you really want to be pedantic about this, can you imagine a scientist and, and, and his or her spouse on the balcony? It's a romantic moment, okay? And the scientist says, Look at the beautiful earth turn, okay? Just ruins the whole thing, right? Ruins the whole thing. We, we use this language because it's observational language and it's also more uh, romantically pleasing, okay? Um, Galileo once said, actually quoting a cardinal of his own church that he dearly loved, um, that the Bible teaches us how one goes to heaven, not how the heaven goes. A little play on words. Not how, what's really moving is it the earth or the sun that's moving, okay? And I think that's, that was an important um, step of progress in understanding the relation between science and uh, Christian theology. So Galileo and much of the church leadership agreed that one, the Bible is without error, and two, that science can also find truth. And um, there were some pro-Galileo scientists, but remember, Galileo was in the scientific minority at the time, and for good reasons, because not enough evidence had really accumulated to tip the scales uh, definitively in, in the direction of the, of the um, moving earth theory. And there were some pro-Galileo theologians, but they were also in a minority, which kind of made sense, right? Because it was a scientific minority and a theological minority at the time. <clears throat> but it wasn't science versus religion. That's a gross oversimplification of what was really happening here. So I picked this example of one of the six myths in my book because it's the most complicated one to, to really unpack. And there are certain elements of truth. There was apparent conflict here between science and Christianity, but not any essential real conflict, okay? It was just sort of growing pains for science and theology as they were both growing up, okay, together. Didn't you fight with your siblings too, right? And yet you love them, right, oh, basically. So there was, yeah. And contrary to the myth, there was no lengthy jail time, at most a couple of days, and he was, uh, they certainly didn't torture him. I mean, he was the most famous scientist in the world at the time, and a member of the Catholic Church, so they, they didn't torture him. And he had great food and lodging at the, at the embassy in, in the Vatican that, uh, uh, that was uh, owned by his uh, home country. Um, now, the verdict, here is the sad, uh, but ending of the story, but, but, but still not a simple warfare story. The verdict was seven out of the ten judges of the Inquisition declared that Galileo was vehemently, uh, that, uh, vehement suspicion of heresy. That was the, the verdict. Now, notice that three abstained. So, you, again, you have some diversity within, within, the, uh, within the, the church. Uh, but nevertheless, he was forced to retract, and he, he had to live the rest of his life under house arrest in his beautiful country estate, which I visited just before COVID hit. And yes, that's my face, not Galileo's, in a color photograph there. But that's, the, that's where he spent the rest of his life. A wonderful courtyard, and um, uh, I was there with, um, the guy who took this picture is a leading historian of Newton, uh, and we were uh, both there just kind of, you know, going through Galileo's stuff and seeing, you know. Actually, it's, it's a museum now, but, um, but he did live there. Um, Right. Now, uh, if there had been, you know, one thing about history you need to know is history often is highly contingent. If things had been just a little bit different here or there, many different outcomes might have, might have occurred. If Galileo, Galileo had been a more modest person, uh, more tactful, then this might not have occurred. He had this really bad habit of mocking people with whom he disagreed. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> and if the politics of the time had been different, the Pope was under a lot of pressure for various reasons to, to come down hard on Galileo. Remember, this is during, this is during the Counter-Reformation, okay? So a lot of things happening and the Pope had on, on his mind. Um, so the simplistic story says 
the Inquisition is Christianity. It typifies Christianity, which it really doesn't, okay? Um, and that Galileo is science as opposed to religion. Well, Galileo thought of himself as a good Christian, and he thought of himself as helping his own church to better understand the relation between science and theology. In fact, he wrote a, a famous letter, his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, where he uh, does a brilliant job of showing how science and theology can work in harmony with each other. And this is, again, part of the progress in this relationship between science and theology. Um, and this was an unfortunate time of growing pains in that growth process, okay? So it's a very, but the complex story, which is much more interesting and, and accurate to the details, is that, um, that not only was science and theology progressing, but the relation between the two was being worked out in more detail. And this controversy, I think, has important implications for contemporary uh, controversies within, within the church and uh, about how to interpret the Bible in relation to certain contemporary scientific theories. So I think there's important lessons to be drawn from this. Galileo and, and Kepler, his contemporary, were pioneers in not only science, but also in relating science to theology. So I want to just cover um, a bit of chapter 10 in my book, uh, sort of the, the flip side of the coin. What's the positive argument for a good relation between science and theology? Kepler's a good case study. So you're, you might have heard of Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. His first law was that planets move not in circular paths, but in elliptical paths. And I've exaggerated the ellipse here, just so you can see its properties, the two foci and so on. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, that's his first. The other two laws give detailed details about uh, how the planets move in, the, in this elliptical sh shaped orbit. Now, uh, Kepler uh, contrasted his science with the, that of Aristotle who believed that, uh, along with Plato and others, that, that the perfect circle was, uh, the circle or, and the sphere, if you're thinking three-dimensionally, was the perfect figure and, and the way the world should be, right? And, and Kepler contrasted his science with Aristotle, and here's a quote from Kepler. Aristotle, who did not believe that the world had been created and thus could not recognize the mathematical design plans for the material world, because without an architect, there is no such power in mathematics to make anything material. Some of it I've paraphrased that's out of the quotes because it's, his prose is very uh, unwieldy, okay? It's hard to kind of grasp, but that's what he said, um, essentially. So let's unpack this quote. Uh, <clears throat> basically, he says that mathematics is passive. It can't do anything. Now, mathematics and mathematical principles can be used in uh, an architect or an engineer to, to make something. You can use mathematical principles, let's say in gears, in a watch, an old-fashioned watch, or um, uh, in a robot. Uh, but, uh, or it, when it comes to a universe, there are certain mathematical principles that have been used to, to get a universe that's just right for life, right? And um, Kepler is saying that a pagan like Aristotle, although Aristotle contributed some important things for science, there were certain limitations because of his worldview as to how much he can contribute to science. And he's pinpointing a, a problem with his worldview that, that partially limited his, his ability to recognize that, um, that there could be mathematical natural laws. Aristotle tended to separate mathematics from natural laws. His natural laws were more qualitative, hot, cold, wet, dry, but not quantitative. And that's one of the brilliant things about modern science is the quantification and how um, mathematics has been used to explain many things in the universe because, as Kepler will explain in a moment, mathematics from the mind of God was used to design the universe. Okay? Now, Kepler said that that he uh, and others were finding mathematical rules for the physical world, such as his three laws of planetary motions. He said that, that he was preconditioned to, to do this kind of research because it's acceptable, here's Kepler speaking, it's acceptable to me and to all Christians since our faith holds that the world was created by God in weight, measure, and number. That is in accordance with ideas co-eternal with him. All right, now let's unpack this quote. Basically, he's saying math exists in God's mind, and it has so eternally. Whether you're thinking uh, uh, binomial you know, formula, uh, 
Pythagorean theorem, whatever. That was eternally in the mind of God as true things about mathematics. God then selected some of these mathematical principles to instantiate in physical laws, such as gravity and so on. Could have been, could have been an inverse cube law, but it turned out to be an inverse square law, right? Remember that. So, um, and because God made us in his image, we can discover those laws. And the, one of the most uh, memorable quotes of Kepler is that because we're made in God's image, we can, and we, we're, we're set up that we can, can, we can discover those laws because we can, sh- quote, share in his own thoughts. So the, the, here we have design and designer kind of paired together. Because we're like the designer, lesser than, of course, but like him in certain respects, we can think like him and sort of rethink his thoughts as we discover things in science. So this is a theological uh, foundation for modern science. God was free, of course, according to Christian theology, including Kepler's. God was free to make many different kinds of cosmoses, but he chose this particular cosmos. So you can't just deduce by armchair philosophy how the universe must be, that this, the, the, the planetary motion must be circular, as, which tended to be the Greek way of looking at it, the pagan Greek way of view, looking at it. But Christians said, look, there are many ways that he could have done this. The circle was one possibility, but there's various other uh, closed curve figures that he could have used that have interesting mathematical properties, beautiful ones. And um, Kepler tested the uh, kind of an egg shape uh, path, and he tested the ellipse. And of all the different shapes, including the circle, the ellipse best fit a a huge new mass of of planetary observations that had been collected by his previous boss, who conveniently died, and gave uh, Kepler got a hold of all of his data. Now there's this kiss and tell story that Kepler killed his boss, but he didn't. They actually dug up his body twice, found no evidence of poisoning. And it would be totally inconsistent with Kepler's worldview to poison his boss, anyway. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so science requires testing multiple possible hypotheses to see which one best fits the data. And there's a theological basis for that, right? Because God could have done it many different ways, but there is the, the expectation that he would have done it in some beautiful, efficient, kind of engineering, mathematical way. And indeed, that's what the ellipse shows. And Newton was able to show, weave that into his larger theory uh, and confirm a lot of what Galileo and Kepler did. And then finally, uh, the moving Earth uh, theory was shown beyond reasonable doubt. So, what lessons to be learned? Theology helped guide science. So, worldview matters, either positively or negatively, with respect to the practice of science. So, Stuart Burgess pointed out some of the negative ways that uh, a faulty worldview can distort science and hinder scientific progress. I'm giving the flip side of the story, how theology, in some cases, uh, a worldview in, uh, that is guided by a, a particular Christian theology has actually helped in the development of science. So Galileo and other Christians, uh, like Kepler, were guided by um, metaphors taken from a Christian worldview. One of the most uh, amazing ones, is this two-book metaphor that God wrote not just one book, the book of Scripture, the Bible, but he also wrote another book, what they called the book of nature. And Galileo understood that much of this book is written in the language of mathematics. So if you want to study the Bible, you need to learn Hebrew, Greek, a little Aramaic wouldn't hurt either. If you want to do science in many fields, you've got to know mathematics. And mathematics ultimately comes from the mind of God. But you, as a small designer in science and engineering, can learn some of this and then sort of think God's thoughts after him, which is how Kepler is typically paraphrased. Now here's a fascinating passage of scripture that was important in the development of science. Jeremiah 31 says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Now, what's translated into English, fixed order, is a single Hebrew word that means something like a royal decree or a law. And um, in this case, you have 
that, that this uh, engendered an analogy between the creator God as being like a king on earth, you would know that you've entered into a kingdom if you go into a new territory and people are behaving in, according to certain patterns, certain rules, right? About, let's say, traffic, lights, and so on, right? And in a similar way, when you look around you, you see things that look like they're behaving according to uh, a very systematic or orderly fashion by certain laws. And this, of course, was an important conceptual foundation for science. So even though the Bible itself is not a scientific textbook, it's not written technically to try to tell us whether the earth or the sun moves, on the other hand, the Bible does provide some of the deeper foundations for a kind of way of viewing the world that has been very science-friendly. And that's the story that doesn't get told that I tell in my book, Unbelievable. Because what's unbelievable are the stories that tell that Christianity is at war with science almost always. That's the unbelievable story. So, and this all ties back to the contemporary philosophical view of scientism which, as I will remind you as we close here, scientism is the view that only science, not religion, is reasonable. But scientism is based on, th in this case, three, uh, three points that are all faulty. Otherwise, it could be a stable foundation, three points, right? But this is a very faulty one because it's based on fake stories about Christianity, about the history of science, these fake war stories. It's based on the misunderstanding that, that oh, surely Christianity could never have any ideas that would be helpful or stimulating positive, positive results in science. I've showed you an example, a couple of examples of, yes, it has. And then third, scientism assumes that there's no way to rationally evaluate religion. Now, Steve Meyer in his book, The Return of the God Hypothesis, does show how science, coupled with philosophical arguments, can give you really strong arguments for not only a designer, but, but, but certain characteristics of that designer that even further uh, push you in the direction of uh, not just a generic God, but a God that very uh, amazingly matches the God revealed in the Bible. Thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.